Yeah. It's all right to get hype in church. It's all right to get hype in church. Yes. It's serious. We mean business. We've been making disciples, and we're going to continue to make disciples. And because of that, the enemy is standing in opposition against us. That's why this means war. And uh, this series is birthed out of our last series of making disciples because as we advance the gospel, we will face opposition. As we try to help people follow Jesus, we will face opposition. And this is a statement that Calvary is not going to move or budge every time we are under attack. We are standing firm in God. Amen. Praise you, God. It's a little personal for me, too, because he's been trying to, the enemy's been trying to throw everything at me to discourage me my first two months here, and I got news for the devil. You've driven me to my knees depending on God, and now I'm even more dangerous. Amen. Even more dangerous. Now, don't get me wrong, I've always been dependent on God and on my knees praying, but it's just been frequent flyer miles right now with God. And uh, now, you know, when you kick the fire, you spread that fire, and that's what he's done. He's, he's hit the hornet's nest with me and our staff and our church, and so now he has to deal with us being clothed in the armor and the power of God. Amen. So that's why this series exists, and uh, listen, we, we can come in here hype if you want. I, I know there's a couple that came in here with some fatigues on, because they mean, they're not joking around. Where are you at? Jay, I'm, I'm calling you out. <laughs> Jamie and Mike, look at that, they came to battle. They came to battle. I love it, I love it. And what's cool is I know that they're battling outside these walls every day fighting for the kingdom of God. So I'm a little hype about this because it's been, it's, it's funny because I was like, okay, this is Thanksgiving Christmas. Like, what am I thinking? Doing a series about warfare during the holidays, right? But I got to tell you something. Satan doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving or Christmas. He doesn't take a day off. And he's always trying to destroy the works that, that God is doing, and he's, he's, he's not, it's not going to work. And it's not going to work against this church. We're going to continue to be aware and fight. Today is an overview, a little bit of what this is all about. I'm, I'm going to expose some things that the devil does so that you're more prepared and wise today to fight. And I want to even just make sure you understand that there really is spiritual warfare. Amen. Like spiritual warfare is real. There may be a few reasons why, why you may not see spiritual warfare, um, and I don't, I don't want to judge or anything like that, but there are some situations where if we're not out there making disciples, we probably won't see opposition because the enemy isn't scared of you or threatened by you. But as you begin to make disciples, he is threatened by you, and so he'll start to come against you. Um, also, we get so blinded by the things of this world, we don't realize that we're under attack. You know, the worries and the things of this world become, you know, they kind of become like this, uh, this veil over our eyes where we don't see that actually this, that the enemy, Satan, is behind what's going on in my life right now. Oh, oh that's, just, that's just the worries of life. That's just the way life is. No, the enemy's behind a lot of that or all of it, trying to discourage you from advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ in your own home, even in believing in the word of God in your own heart. And then as you go share the gospel to those around you, he is coming against you in slick and devious ways. He's a weasel. He sneaks in like that. So I'm here to expose that and uh, pray for me because I'm sure because of this, I'll be even under more attack. But it's all good. It's all good. Now, I'm not saying that we get weird and obsessive about spiritual warfare and we start seeing things everywhere. Okay, I want to make that clear, okay? I'm going to define more of that as we go on, but there's no doubt that, that warfare exists simply because of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, Paul tells the church to put on the form of God. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. 
We're going to start in verse 10. And I'm not going to break down the scripture entirely today because I want to break it down through this series in different ways. Today, again, is more of an overview of what's going on. And we need to really be aware of the warfare around us. But this is the encouraging word that Paul gives the church. Now, here's some context for you. Paul's in prison because of spiritual warfare. Paul's in prison for two years, and so he's writing letters to the church while he's in prison, and he's actually shackled to a Roman soldier. He's in chains, and it was common that they would chain them to a soldier. And so he is looking at this soldier, and he's looking at his armor, and he gives us, he's using that metaphor to teach us what we need to put on as Christian soldiers, just to help you understand that. And he's writing this letter, and this is what he says, a final word. He's ending the letter. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil or schemes. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. What is he referring to there? He's talking about people. You're not fighting against people. People are not your enemy. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, look, we can gloss right over that and think that that's like, um, that's not literal or that's poetic. That's a poetic scripture. No, this is a literal letter from Paul to the church saying, this is what we actually face. Therefore, he says, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now. See, he's in prison now. Chained. Still preaching this message as God's ambassador. I love that. Still preaching the message in chains, in prison. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. I would like to believe that that soldier got saved. (laughs) Next to Paul, but we have no idea. A.W. Tozer said a bold statement in this in this quote, and he wasn't this wasn't a compliment, it was a concern. He said, People think of this world not as a battleground, but as a playground. We are not here to fight, we are here to frolic. We are not in a foreign land, we are at home. Tozer was concerned because the church was delusional about the reality of this life. Those are believe that we are on battlegrounds, not playground. That we are in a foreign land, that we're only here for a moment, we're not here forever. And that there's souls to be saved, there's work to be done. And so getting comfortable and, and making a nice comfy life for us here and doing absolutely nothing for the kingdom of God was not an option for A.W. Tozer in his life or for the church. And in fact, that's what Paul's telling the church, you need to be ready for when the evil times come, when Satan comes to attack and come against you by having on the armor of God. And this is something we do daily, not every once in a while or every time we do an event or outreach. So church, we need to wake up and we need to be aware of the war that's against us, but not obsessed with the warfare. Our focus is not on the attacks, but on the mission. I wanna make sure we have a sober, balanced view of this so we don't get too hyper about spiritual warfare and people are like looking around for demons or something like that. That's not what we're doing. We focus on the mission of God and when we come against, here's the things you'll come against. You'll come against false teaching. You'll come against people who are just very hard about believing in Jesus or maybe you'll come against doubt or lies or maybe you're your own worst enemy one day and you're just not believing or hearing anything or, or believing that God loves you or that you are doing, like you are a soldier for Christ or that 
that you are holy, all these things he'll use against us to slow us down. He can even use people to hurt us, to slow us down. We need to be awake and aware of that, and so that's why I'm going to continue to break down this series. So what is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is not Ghostbusters. We're not trying to find evil forces, walk around town and destroy them. No. Spiritual warfare is defensive when we are attacked, but offensive or on the offense with God's love and truth. Melvin Tinkler from Oxford University, and I have some, some other people, spiritual leaders, I want to bring into this so you know it's not just me saying these things. And to also add, to also uh, just complement what the Word of God already says. Melvin Tinkler says, winning against Satan is not a question of claiming some kind of imagined authority over him. We simply need to pursue righteousness, avoid sin, and stand firm in the truth. What is the goal of this warfare? Is it to disarm angelic beings? No. Christ has already done that on the cross. As we read in Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It is simply, it is simply that we take a stand, remain immovable, and that paradoxically is to advance. You advance by standing firm, as Paul repeats three times in Ephesians 6. A.W. Tozer, once again, in his book, The Incredible Christian, says this. Now, follow this. This is, this is important. This is deep. If Satan opposes the new convert or the new Christian, he opposes still more bitterly the Christian who is pressing on toward a higher life in Christ. The spirit-filled life is not, as many suppose, a life of peace and quiet pleasure. So in other words, the Christian life isn't always a life of peace and quiet pleasure. Listen, I got to break something down real quick. When you become a believer, everything doesn't become nice roses and, and like nice dandy flowers and there's no troubles coming against you. That's not reality. And in fact, Jesus says, take up your cross, which means to identify, be willing to, to lay down your life like he did and count the cost. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was crucified. So that's the life we can kind of really be ready for, and we need to be ready for. Viewed one way, this I'm going to continue on, the Christian life is a pilgrimage through a robber-infested forest. Viewed another, it is a grim warfare with the devil. Always there is struggle, and sometimes there is a pitched battle with our own nature where the lines are so confused. Now, this is crazy, because this is what I see, too, in Scripture where the lines are so confused that it is all but impossible to locate the enemy or to tell which impulse is of the spirit and which one is of the flesh. In other words, what he's saying here is that sometimes you can't tell if it's the enemy or if it's even yourself operating in your sinful nature, giving in to your sinful desires. But the thing is, is that Satan works in that because he exploits our sinful nature. He knows where we're weak, and so he uses things to get us off track. So I thought that was important to make sure I clarify. My point here is, he goes on to say, is that if we want to escape the struggle, we have but to draw back and accept the currently accepted, low-keyed Christian life as the normal one, which is not a good idea. What he's saying here is, is if you want to not face conflict, just don't do anything for God. If you want to live an easy life, do nothing for God and you'll be good. Satan won't bother you. That will ground our power, stunt our growth, and render us harmless to the kingdom of darkness. Compromise will take the pressure off. Satan will not bother a man who has quit fighting. But the cost of quitting will be a life of peaceful stagnation. In other words, you won't grow. You won't experience God the way you could. You won't see the protection of God, the power of God. You won't see lives changed in front of you because you're advancing the gospel. I don't want that kind of life. I'd rather go through the battle than have a cute, little, cozy, comfortable life. Because people are going to hell, and that's going to be worse than me going through momentary troubles here on earth. So we sons of eternity, he says, just cannot afford such a thing. In other words, we need to fight. We need to stay in the fight. And the fighting isn't, again, being a hunter for ghosts or demons or spirits. It's advancing the gospel message. 
and loving people. Now, here's a basic definition of spiritual warfare. It's when the kingdom of darkness comes against the kingdom of God. Spiritual warfare is when the enemy opposes any of God's plans, purposes, or his people. The mission is to return the people of this world back to their creator God, but the devil does everything possible to thwart that goal. And just so you know, simply being a child of God puts targets on your back. And every time we do something good for the king of God, it puts a target on our back. But I got news for us. Satan isn't the only enemy. And I need to make sure I bring this out today moving forward. We actually face three enemies. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, by the way, we're going to hang out in Ephesians a lot during this series. It's going to make a lot more sense as you read the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. He's talking about spiritual death. You used to live, he's talking to a church that's now saved. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. So you have sin, you have the world, and you have the devil controlling and working in this world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. In other words, sinners. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our own sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger or wrath, just like everyone else. But I love this verse. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Amen. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. See, we're actually fighting the world, not the people of this world, because the flesh, other humans are not our enemy, but the system of this world that Satan is using against us, the entertainment, the pleasures, all those things. Then we, we battle. Now, here's the thing. Everyone's going to think, oh, Ryan's misinterpreting scripture because we don't, we don't battle against flesh or blood. You have to understand the interpretation of that. Flesh doesn't mean your sinful nature in that verse. Flesh means other people. Our battle is not with other people because they're also being manipulated by Satan. Okay? We do wrestle with our sinful nature. We do have to be careful that we don't entertain its wicked desires. And I'm going to bring that, break that down further on in this message today so we understand. But what's going on is, and I want to expose this today. I know this is heavy and deep, and it's serious, but we need to understand this truth. The devil is working in the world, knowing our weaknesses, and using this world to get to us and to make us slip up and mess up and be distracted. That's what he does. He's really good at it. And he's, that's all he's doing. He doesn't have anything else on his agenda but to destroy us and devour us. That's it. David Garland, from his exegetical commentary on the book of Luke, wrote this. The devil may be fawning and wily to break one's commitment to God, or he may be hostile and deadly. He appeals to the innate selfishness of humans to get us to disobey God. And he quotes this, you desire things, you deserve them, and you will get them. The word that we get, can gain anything we want in life, like wealth, health, the perfect mate, business success, respect from others, is irresistible to those who are obsessed with themselves. In other words, Satan knows we're really selfish. And so what does he do? He gets us to be completely obsessed with getting whatever we want. Like use your life to get all the wealth you can, the health, the perfect person in your life to be with, business success, respect from others. Now all those aren't necessarily wrong, but when they become the God of our life, they are wrong. And that's how he's slick, because there's nothing wrong with having good health or having a, a person in your life to be married to. There's nothing wrong with that. But when, when selfish desires take over, that's Satan. That's not Jesus. The devil can quote scripture, by the way, and tells lies about God so that evil masquerades as something good. He can get persons to believe that their personal interests 
are indistinguishable from God's interests. In other words, they're more important than God's and just as important. When we do not get what we want, the devil uses a snake-headed bitterness that rears up from the caverns of the heart to destroy others and ourselves. So, so when we don't get something because we're selfish, then we get bitter about it, and he uses that against us. And that's where we start hurting other people. Satan also tries to lead us to mistrust God and so to put God to the test. I have a couple more authors I want you to hear from. Jim Aleef, he says this, as Christians, we are involved in a battle. Our arch enemy is Satan who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The way, the way in which he devours unworried people is by tempting them to sin, by convincing them that sin is a more rewarding master than Christ. He therefore disguises himself and his agents, and he makes the pleasures of sin appear very appealing to us. And Satan does not just attack us from the front where we can clearly see him. He attacks from every side. Jerry Bridges says, while God most often appeals to our wills through reason, sin and Satan usually appeal to us through our desires. So even when we know that something's not right, even when we know that that's not what the word of God says, Satan battles the will and reason of God with our desires, our flesh, sinful nature desires, and tempts us and brings things into our lives to get us off track. But there's a scripture for that. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You see, that's, that's what it is. Satan knows that. He knows how good God is to us. He's very aware that it's like amazing grace towards us. He's aware that he lost. Sometimes we got to remind him, right? He's aware. And so he's doing everything he can because he's a sore loser to mess you up to mess up your family, to mess up your neighbors, to mess up your community, your churches. We're going to get into that too, this series. He's doing everything he can because he can't stand the fact that we're going to be loved and forgiven for eternity, that we're going to be in the goodness of God for eternity. But I have really good news for us because that sounds like really gloomy stuff, doesn't it? We are victorious in Jesus Christ. We are victorious over every scheme, over every sin, over every plan of the devil. We are victorious. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. It's in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'm going to start with verse 6 because we already read 1 through 5. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ Jesus so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us. So you're billboards of God's grace when you believe in him. You're showing the world that God can take brokenness and mend it and fix it and heal it. That God can take the worst of sinners and make them brand new. You're a billboard of God's grace to this world. He goes on to say this, shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Verse eight, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us, created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Here's the reality. We were powerless. We couldn't save ourselves. It looked really bad. And then the victor shows up on the scene, and his name is Jesus. And he saw how bad it is. And so he laid down his life. He didn't live a selfish life. He, he lived a selfless life. 
He laid down his life, a sacrificial life, so that we could be set free from the grip of sin and Satan. And he did that for all who believe. He's done that for everyone, but only those who believe can receive those promises. And that's a promise that we stand on. 1 John 5, 4 says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. But not just through our faith. It's, what he's saying here is, is our faith in God, because we don't do it. God does it. Our faith in God. In Christ, we are no longer controlled by our flesh or sinful nature. i got to read this before we go today. Romans 6. You have to see this, because a lot of us struggle uh, with sin. But listen, we only struggle with it because we give it power and domain in our lives too much. We're, we're allowing it to control us. We're allowing it to, to take over. But you can have freedom because of who you are in Christ and how he set you free from it. Verse 5 says this in Romans chapter 6. And it's on the screen for you as well. Since we, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful nature, our old sinful cells were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Did you hear that? So that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we die with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we die with Christ, we know we will also live with him. What does that mean, die with Christ? To deny yourself, to, to admit that you are a sinner and that you believe in Jesus Christ. The old man is put to death and the new creation has come. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are no longer your old person. You are a new person. This is what Paul was trying to teach in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are new creation when we have Jesus and he's forgiven us of our sins. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. In other words, you don't have to respond to the desires of sin. Just be dead to it. Don't respond to it. Don't, don't give it time or day. Let it go. Let it pass you. Resist the temptation. It says in verse 12, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. So he's, he's telling us how we actually do it. So while we have been set free from sin, look what we have to do. We still have to resist the sinful nature that's still in us that's not completely gone yet. The power of sin over us has been defeated. And through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we have power over sin. But we have to cooperate with the power of Jesus in us. We have to cooperate with our identity in Jesus Christ. We have to remember we are no longer slaves to sin, but alive in Jesus Christ. And so we can't give our bodies or our lives to sin. And we don't want to because we know Satan's using that. And man, this is, this is heavy, isn't it? But listen, he, he, the enemy doesn't want me to teach on this. He doesn't want you to know how he works. And here's the thing. He doesn't want you to know that you're set free from sin. We sang that today. Yeah, no longer slaves of fear. We're no longer slaves of sin. We need to walk in that. It doesn't have power over us anymore. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise. The reason why that's important today is because we get so defeated when we mess up, right? I've been there. Man, I slipped up. Look, we're not perfect yet. Those times will come. But we remind ourselves, we go back to the word of God and remember that he loved us and all our sins have been paid for on the cross. And we confess those sins and then we walk in repentance and turn away from them again. But the reality is, is God loves us still in spite of that. He goes on to say this. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now, you're new but now you have new life. 
So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we have a license to continue to sin? No. What I teach is we have the license to learn from it and not return to it. It's a second chance. It's a license to learn. When you receive grace or, or kindness from God or even from other believers, it's a chance to repent and be different. It's a, it's a chance. Like, if I hurt my wife and she forgives me, I'm not going to be like, all right, cool, now I can, I can do that again because she'll just forgive me. No, I don't want to trample on the grace of my wife. I want to respect her for what she did, for, for forgiving me. And so therefore now I love her even better and more and I'm, and I'm more careful how I treat her. Forgiveness isn't a license to sin. It's a license to change. Amen. And one of my favorites here is, in Christ we overcome the devil's grip on us. Colossians 2, we're going to go back to that real quick. Colossians 2, I got the mic late, just so you guys know. Sorry. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly in his, by his victory over them on the cross. His death on the cross gave us freedom from the power of sin, from the power of this world, and the power of Satan. We really are victorious. We have already won the battle. Amen? We have already won. Praise God. So we need to walk in that truth. The cross, the resurrection, all dealt a fatal blow to Satan. It weakened and limited the power that he has. But unfortunately, it did not annihilate him yet. And because he is a sore loser, he's trying to take us down with him. He's in the loser bracket. Trying to, trying to mess things up, trying to catch up, and he'll never do it. He knows he'll never do it. He knows that God's love is greater. Church, this is just the beginning of this series. Today, I wanted you to understand that warfare is real, but also understand the position that you stand in as a believer in Jesus Christ. You are truly victorious. You don't have to be beat up by the works of the devil in this life. You don't have to be controlled by your sinful nature and the things that you wrestle with that you desire that are wrong. You don't have to. In this world, it's just, we're just passing through. We gotta be really careful that we're not looking at shiny things that Satan's put up in front of us. There's only so much time. There's only so much time. I wanna encourage you this week to stay in the fight and here's what you can do. You can study the word, and if you want, please study Ephesians with me. I want you to stand firm in this victorious inheritance and privilege that Jesus has won for us. It's so crazy that by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been saved. He fought to death for you and I. And surely, his work accomplishes much, right? His death accomplishes victory for all of us. And so we need to walk in that. So stand firm in that truth. And again, we're not hunting for demons. We are fighting for our community with the love of God. Your focus this week, my focus this week, isn't to try to blast a demon with a laser or something like that. Our focus is to combat the enemy with the love of Jesus Christ by loving those around us. Listen, I got to tell you this now. I was going to try to save it, but I'm going to close with this. 
Sam Cruz and I went to uh, we went to CR to do a world religions class to teach on Christianity, and we get the you know she invites every different religion to come in, so he and I tag team. It was a lot of fun. And so I shared a brief overview of what Christianity is, and then we open up for questions. And church, I'm telling you, this, this next generation, they have no idea. And, but here's the thing, they were hungry. This, these, these, uh, we went for three classes. And I left so encouraged. I mean, even after one of the classes, they're like, hey, what church do you go to, and what time are your services? <laughs> But here's the thing. Someone asked the question, what's your favorite Bible verse? I was like, oh, I love that kid right now. <laughs> we dropped like four verses on them. One of them was, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Satan doesn't want them to know that. They think they have to get everything put together before God would love them. He already loves them. He'll put them together when we come to him. So we started dropping all these scriptures on them. And then it was at the end of this class, one of the girls started crying because we were talking about healing stories. We've seen God heal here at this church and in the city. And one of the girls started crying and we're like, what's going on? She said, my mom has kidney failure and I want to pray for healing. And we, we asked if we could, the teacher said no. And that was fine. So I told her, I said, when you go home, I want you to put your hand on her and pray for a physical healing of her kidneys in Jesus' name. Now listen, this is, I mean, I, mean, I hope, I might, not, I might get in trouble. I might not get invited back because this is going to be online and stuff. But listen, we were in a dark place at CR, behind enemy lines, sharing the love and truth of Jesus Christ. And we started breaking walls down with a generation that needs Jesus really, really bad. Amen. 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 I say that to tell you that you don't realize how hungry people are in your community. You don't realize it. They are so hungry for something more. They're hungry for God. They're sick of the evil effects on their lives. They want more hope and love, and it's Jesus Christ. So I pray. I'm going to pray right now. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. I, I pray, God, that as we leave this place today, we will fight with the love of Jesus Christ. We will fight with the truth of his word and that we will go into this world and share the truth of your love. Thank you, God. Even in this room right now, help us to believe your love. Lord, help us to receive the truth as we study your word. God, we wield our swords this week to cut down every false teaching and lie that the enemy has put up and we spread the truth of your love. God, I pray for families, individuals, homes, communities. God, that we would come back to your word and God, that you would destroy the strongholds on these families' lives. These children and these youth in our schools break the stronghold of the enemy, the blinders that have been put up by the enemy. According to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the enemy has blinded the minds of unbelievers. God, I pray as we go and proclaim the word, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of the Lord. Lord, I pray that as we preach the word, as we share the word with our friends, and we text them, we post the word, that it will break down the blinders and the strongholds in people's lives, and they would be open to receive the truth of Jesus Christ. God, do a work in our hearts this week too. God, we put on the armor of God we put on the truth of your promises and your power. As we read your word this week, God, fix us, repair. We've been wounded in battle, but we're ready to go back out. So send us out, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that your word never fails and that your word goes on forever. We give you the glory and praise for today and for this truth, and we look forward to this series, God, to keep growing and learning.